Hi, in this tutorial we're going to look at a, a method of emulating cell division, or at least the sort of outward appearance of cell division, um, in a very simple case, just two spheres really. Uh, but we're going to be, use be using particles to do this, not n particles, but Maya's uh, more old-fashioned particles. But um, we'll also involve a little deforming animation, uh, some creative key setting, and things like that. So uh, what we're shooting for is something like this. One cell that appears to divide and pinch off like that. And this would be a little bit difficult to do uh, using um, geometry because it's difficult to make that sort of uh, change like that. Now you could do it by creating geometry that looks like that and then in the next frame switching out geometry that looks like that. And that's actually always one good solution too. Uh, but this uh, technique will allow us to look at some uh, particle control uh, techniques uh, as well as uh, looking at UV mapping and things like that. So the setup is uh, pretty simple. Uh, we're just starting with uh, actually two cubes that are going to be covered in smooth, covered in particles, and they'll spread apart to give us something like this. So let me just start all this from scratch. Just going to hide all these things. And just hide all that stuff. So first of all, the thing I'm going to do is uh, just create a polygon cube. I'm going to scale it up a little bit. going to smooth it three times, or to a division level of three, and delete its history, freeze transformations, and I'm just going to move it over a little bit, something like five or six units over. Again, freeze the transformations. And now I'm going to duplicate it. And so what I'm going to do now is create a uh, an object um, that uh, is in its pinched form. So I'll just use a lattice deformer, something like this with three divisions in uh, ST and U. And I'm just going to pull these over and scale them down. So I'm just making this kind of pinched shape. I can select this object, delete its history to get rid of that deformer. And then I'm just going to, well, I'm going to name this thing first. Cell. And then I can use what's called a blend shape to make this thing assume this thing shape. So you select the blend shape target first, the, uh, the shape that you want it to assume, and then shift select the base, the, the object that you want to have its uh, shape change. So go to Create Deformers Blend Shape and just make sure everything is set to its defaults and Create. Now if I select this object, there's a Blend Shape node and I can just use that to have it change the shape. Now these Blend Shape nodes uh, will only work between objects with exactly the same topology um, or at least uh, this could be an unsmooth and this could be a smooth version of it but it has to have the same, essentially the same layout. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to duplicate this object, but I'm going to duplicate it with its input graph, so it also has a blend shape node. So edit, duplicate special, make sure duplicate input graph is turned on, just do that. Now you can see this is a, another object with the same 
blend shape. So I'll just rotate this around. So I want these two things to be pointed at each other because they'll be the two daughter cells. And I'll move it over the same distance. Just six, I guess, away from the origin. So now I can, if I put them both into this mode, they'll be pointing at each other. This is maybe a little too far away, but I'm going to be animating this anyway, but I'm just going to kind of put it into the position that I want. Something like that. I can delete this object now. And their blend shape should still work. Yep. Now the last thing I'm going to do, well not the last thing, but the next thing I'm going to do is combine these into a single um, a polygon object, I'll merge them, or sorry, combine them. Um, now there's one thing that uh, I forgot to do, but I'll do it now. Uh, it would have been easier if I had done it first, but um, if I select this object and go into, well, let me tell you the reason I'm going to do this. I have to give each of these objects distinct UVs uh, that don't overlap because I'm going to have particles stick to these objects, and the way they know where to stick is by referring to a UV address. So um, I want to make sure that none of the UV mapping addresses on this one overlaps with the one on this one. Let me just show what I mean. So I'm going to select this object, go to Window, UV Texture Editor, and we can see there's the basic UV layout for the original cube. So I'm going to organize it a little bit here and let me just do it and then maybe it'll make sense when I'm done. I'm just going to select these edges here that are dividing these two parts of the T and go to Polygons, Cut UV Edges. So now you can't really see. If I turn on um, Border Edges here, now you can see there's a border edge between these two. If I go to UV Mode, I'm right clicking to go to UV Mode, selecting a few UVs in this area. And if I hold down control and right mouse button, I can say go to shell. And so that will select all the UVs in this little patch that is distinct from any other patch. So this is called a shell. So I'm going to rotate this around and move it down. So what I'm trying to do here is, this is the UV space, this gray box, this darker gray box here. And it goes from 0 to 1 in U and 0 to 1 in V. And because I'm going to have particles stick to these objects, um, I want the UVs of this uh, sphere to be all below 0.5 and the UVs of this one to be all above 0.5. Uh, that way I know that I won't get any overlapping particles. So I'm going to select all the UVs here and just scale them. So I'm using all the same transformation tools that I normally use. And I'm trying to sort of maximize my use of the UV space here. Move these down. Now I'll do the same thing uh, for this one. Now these are still separate objects, but I'm just going to prepare them for combining. Go to Edge Mode. Just select these edges. It might be faster. Just select all these ones. Deselect these ones. Deselect these ones. Ugh. And again, polygons. Cut UV edges. Go to UVs. Select a few here. Control, right click. Control, right click to shell. And then rotate them. About 90 degrees. This time I'm going to move them up here. So you can see the ones, the UVs on this sphere are occupying the top part of the UV space. And the ones on the other sphere are occupying the bottom part. So there's no overlap. Okay. 
So now if I select both of these objects, you can see they've got separate UV space. They're, they're occupying different parts of the UV space. And I'm maximizing, trying to fill it all up. So now I'm going to select these and combine them. So I don't need to see this anymore. Go to Mesh Combine. And now they're a single object. I'm going to call this one uh, Combined Cell. Now if we look in the channel box here for this new object, I still have those original blend shape nodes, so I can still control this. Oops, for each one. And I want to be able to move these things separately, but they're the same object. And so the easiest way to do that is to use a cluster, because I want to uh, have both these cells start at the middle and then move out uh, and become two separate cells. So to move them separately, even though they're part of the same shape, I can go into vertex mode, select all the vertices in this one, and go to create deformers cluster. And I'll call this uh, daughter one cluster. And then this one, go to vertex, create a cluster here, and call this daughter to cluster. Okay, so now I'm free to move them separately now. I'm really moving the components of the objects, but for what we need to do here, this works just perfectly. So now I'm going to, what I want to do is create an animation of each one starting in the middle and then moving out and while they move they pinch down and then pop back into shape. But I'm going to use a set driven key to do this and the set driven key is uh, when uh, other uh, attributes are controlled by keyframes when an attribute is controlled by the keyframes in another attribute so one attribute is driving action in another. So uh, let me just do it and you'll see what I mean. <coughs> so now I want to right click on here and nope, I do not want to right click on there. I want to open up the attribute editor for the combined cell transform node and I'm going to create a new attribute. I'm going to call it um, a cell pincher. Let's say he's well pincher, pincher. So the minimum will be zero, the maximum will be one, default will be zero. And I'll add that, and now we find that in our extra attribute area, and it's also here in our um, channel box. I'm just going to copy this tab so I can have a copy of it out here because I have to go back to it a few times. And so I want this little slider that I just made to drive the values of other things. So I'm going to use a set driven key. Okay, so let's see how this goes. First of all, I'm going to drive the um, movement of the cells. So I'm going to select this one, daughter two cluster, daughter one cluster. So let's do daughter one cluster first. And I want to animate its movement in X. So translate X, I'm going to right click on this and say, sorry, I have to control right click and go to set driven key. And it opens up this new dialog box where we see uh, the driver and the driven. So what's being driven here is the translate X of the daughter one cluster. And now I have to select um, the cell, load the driver, and then choose cell pincher. So cell pincher will be driving translate X. So what I wanted to do, so when it's fully at, uh, at number one, I want this um, cluster to be in this position. So it's in the right position, cell pincher is at the right number, I can set key. Then when I want it at zero, that means I want this cluster to be moved over here and press key. Now you can see that this 
little slider makes that happen. Great. So let's do the same thing for this one. So I'm going to select uh, daughter cell 2. I'm going to load the new driver, or sorry, the new driven. Again, translate X. I still have the right driver loaded, the combined cell cell pincher. And so when it's at 1, I want it to be in this position. So I can just hit key, go to 0. I want this to be completely overlapping this one. Press key. Now be just be careful when you're doing this. You always have to change the driver first. Don't change the driven and then the driver and do a key because it won't work. So now this is working. So now the next thing I want this to do, I want this little cell pincher to also drive the, um, the blend shape of each one of these things. So that pinching action. So that is located in the actual cell itself. Or no, sorry, I actually have to go to Window Animation Editors. Well, this is one way to get it. You go to Blend Shape. So I'm going to open up a Blend Shape uh, window. And so here are my, oops, I've got earlier ones here. So here's Blend Shape 3 and Blend Shape 4. Sorry, not very well named, but um, so I want to do a set driven key on this one too. So I'm going to select uh, Blend Shape 3. I'll load that as the driven. And this P cube, this is the one that I want to select here because that was the original target of the blend shape. So when cell pincher is at zero, I want it to be as is, so I can say key. And then when cell pincher gets to something like 0.7, so when it's separated about that far, maybe a little farther, then I want uh, this blend shape to be at 1, so fully expressed. And I'll key that. And then when it goes all the way out, I want this to pop back. <clears throat> so we'll go back to 0 and key. So we'll get an action like this. It goes out and in and then pops, pops, pops. So I have to do the same thing for the other one. So select the other blend shape, load that as the driven, select the right attribute. So this is correct now, so I'm just going to key that. 0 0.8, I want the blend shape to be at 1. I'll key that. And then when, it, when cell pincher is fully expressed, I want this to go back to 0, and I'll key that. So then we just have one controller that does all this stuff. And I can go in and uh, change a few things if I want to. Um, these are all animated things. So if I select Blend Shape 4, go to Window, Animation Editor's Graph Editor. There's the animation on that blend shape. Now, we haven't talked much about animation yet, but I can still go in and edit those settings. So remember, at zero uh, for cell pincher, it was at zero. At 0 0.8, it got all the way up to one, and at one, it went all the way down to zero. So I can do things like change the interpolation, so how quickly it falls off, things like that. So I can change all of these things if I want to. This is stuff we'll talk about a lot more as things progress. And do the same thing for this one. Don't worry about this. You don't really have to do this part. I just I'm just changing the nature of the animation to make it a little snappier. Okay, so this actually hasn't been animated yet. Even though we're using animation curves and setting keys, this is just we're using keys to connect one attribute to another. I still have to animate this. But before I do that, I have to put particles on these surfaces. Um, and the reason for that is uh, if I just use the polygons and 
I try and use these to render, they won't render really very nicely. Let's get this kind of sharp intersection. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we want to do instead is put particles on these surfaces. Because there's one type of particle uh, called a blobby surface particle that acts like a metaball. So when two of the particles get close to each other, they kind of splooge together to make a continuous smooth surface. And when they get far enough apart, they separate from each other. And so we are going to do that. So we'll go to Particles emit from object. So we want to emit par particles from this object. So let's call this blobby emitter. And the emitter type has to be surface. And then particles per second, I can't remember. Let's try something high, like uh, 500 particles per second. This needs parent UV has to be turned on. And it says nerves, but you can ignore that. Essentially what this does is need parent UV means that when these particles are going to be born on the surface of these objects. And when they're born, with this turned on, it's going to record its location, its UV location on the surface. And we're going to use that information. Turn everything down to zero, speed down to zero, tangent speed. Just make sure. We just want them born on the surface and not to move off. So I'll say create. I'm going to save my file. Saving, still saving. Still saving. Okay. Phew. So now, if I play my animation to give myself a little more breathing space here, so a thousand frames, I'm going to go into four mode. Those are the particles being born on the surface. And they'll just keep adding up and adding up and adding up and adding up. I don't need that many, so I've got the particles selected. In the channel box here, I can go to, there's a max count area here, and I'll change, change it to 500, because I want a maximum of 500. But you'll notice that because uh, I combine these two polygons into a single shape, the particles are being born on both surfaces. And because I separated the UVs uh, of each part of this single shape, although it looks like two shapes, uh, there's going to be no overlap between the particles. So they'll be born in unique areas. Um, so now, right now, the kind of particle that we have is called a point particle. If I open up the attribute editor, go to the particle shape node, I'll call these uh, surface blobbies 2. I think I called the other one surface blobbies 2. Um, I can go down here under render attributes, particle render type is points. What we want to use are blobby surface particles. And let's play the animation again. You can see that they stopped being born after a little while. That's because we hit our max count of 500. And one thing I should say at this point is if you open up your preferences under time slider, you have to make sure playback speed is on play every frame. Uh, whenever you're using anything in Maya that involves dynamics, you have to have play every frame turned on rather than real time, um, which you would use for normal animation. This is because uh, these dynamic simulations are evaluated on every frame. When you go to real time, Maya will, when it's playing things back to you, may try and the, the priority is to play at real time, 30 frames per second. So in order to do that, it may have to skip some frames. And if it skips frames, then the particles won't be evaluated properly. So you have to make sure that you force it to play every frame so the particles are evaluated as you expect. So let me just do a little render here. Um, do a slightly bigger render. Mm -hmm. Taking a little while to render. 
So you can see that the particles are covering the surfaces of these two pieces of geometry, but they're still intersecting with each other. We have to open up the uh, attribute editor for the particles, render attributes, particle render type, lobby surface, add attributes for. Click that button and it'll add attributes for this type. So we have to change the threshold. And I think what I mentioned, uh, maybe, let's just try it. It's a little trial and error. So 0.5, well, this indicates the distance between them before they will merge together. So I'm doing, threshold is half the radius now. See what kind of results we get. <laughs> yeah, so you can see they're starting to merge together a little bit. So. I think what I eventually did with this was 1.5 and 0 0.75. I think that gave me good results, although I'm working at a slightly different scale than last time. So what I'm trying to get is a smooth looking sort of ripply surface. Yeah, so something like that. Let's just keep that for now. Um, now, so we've created our blobby surface particles. We have had them born on the surface of this, this geometry, but as it is, the particles would not stick to the geometry if the geometry moves. They're just being born there, but there's nothing keeping them there. So to do that, we have to make this geometry a goal for these particles. So select the geometry and select the particles and go to particles, um, goal, open up the uh, uh, option box, and make sure goal weight is set to 1 create. Oops. Sorry, I did it in the wrong order. So, now this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Well, it's not tricky, but it just takes a, a little a little work. And So, open up the attribute editor for the, the blobbies particles. And so now we've made the part the um, the polygon objects a goal for the particles. So that means they want to stick to the surface. But if we play the animation now, you can see how they're sticking to the surface in a very regular way. What's actually happening is they're sticking on uh, they're kind of overlapping here a lot. I think I'll turn down the max count. I think that's way too much. Um, 350 maybe. Oh. Uh, yes. Well, one thing I'm going to do is I've, you can see I've got my time slider set to minus 30. With the, with the particles selected, I can go to the start frame and change that to minus 30. So they'll start being born before the uh, renderable time actually starts. This is our what we call our run-up time. Okay, something weird is happening, as usual. Well, I think what's happening is that they're being instead of being randomly distributed over the surfaces, they're going on to each, each vertex uh, of the polygon. And because it's filling up these ones first, it's not totally filling up this one. So we have to randomize that so it's not so regularly placed. So what we have to do for that is select the particle object and under per particle attributes, um, we have to control how the goal weight is it uh, applied to the object. So I'm going to hit general here, go to particle, and we're going to add two attributes, and they're in here, goal u and goal v. And they're added in here. Now these aren't slots where you type, but you right click to add expressions. So what we want to do here is to, essentially what I'm going to be telling Maya is, okay, these particles are going to be born randomly on your surface and we know what the address of their birth is. Their birth is their parent U and parent V. That tells us where on the surface they're born. 
presently what's happening is they're born on a randomly somewhere on the surface, but because we have a goal turned on, they're popping immediately to the components, to the vertices. That's why we're getting this very regular layout that we see here. What we want to do is tell Maya, okay, don't do that. Um, make the goal uh, address the same as their birth address. So we want to say that the goal u and goal v should be equal to the parent u and parent v. And that's exactly what we'll type. So I'm going to create a creation expression. So what happens, so this will be executed when the particles are born. And I'm simply going to type goal u equals parent u semicolon return goal v equals parent v semicolon and then click create. Now when I play back the animation, if all is good, yeah, so now they're born randomly over the surface. Let me just do a little render to make sure it looks the way it should. That looks good. And now I'm just going to, with these blobby surface particles, you'll notice, or maybe you noticed, maybe you didn't, here under particle render type it says blobby surface SW. That means this can be rendered with software renderer, like uh, the Maya software renderer. The other particles, spheres, sprites, points, those are all rendered, rendered with the hardware render buffer. Um, but because of this, uh, we can put shaders onto these particles. So I can open up my hypershade, and I already have this shader created. And I'm going to apply this shader to the selection. So you can create whatever you want for this, and I can render it. So those are our two daughter cells. took 14 seconds. And then the last thing we have to do to make all of this work is to animate them separating and pinching. But of course, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, you'll remember that we already created a little slider to make that happen, the cell pincher. Now you can see when I moved that, it left the particles behind. But the particles have to be evaluated through the action of the timeline. So if I go back to zero, you'll see they're born in the right spot. So what I'm going to do is just scrub up to zero, or to one. I'm going to set a key on cell pincher, just right click and say set key, and then maybe at frame 50. So I'm changing the frame number first, and then changing the value of the attribute, and say set key. And so that's all working. Now they're still pretty close together, I'm worried they'll still merge together. I just wanted to make sure. Nope, they seem to be separate. And the last thing I do, and this is involving a whole other thing, is that I'm just going to turn off show dynamics for a second to hide these. I'm going to put a little jiggle deformer. First of all, I'm going to save this uh, file, but I'm going to put a jiggle deformer on this cell. And what that does is simulate sort of secondary motion. So after they finish their movement, they'll kind of wobble a little bit. Uh, so just so it's not so um, choppy looking. There are different ways you could do this. You could actually animate it by hand. But this is a good place to introduce something like the Jiggle Deformer. It's not a real dynamic solution. It's actually just a deformer. Uh, but it's a simple way to get it to do this sort of thing. Uh, without much work. It just takes a little tweaking the values because sometimes it can go crazy. So select this object, go to Create Deformers, Jiggle Deformer, and I'm just going to leave everything at the default except jiggle only when object stops. Because I only want it to jiggle when they pull apart, pinch, and stop, and then kind of reverberate a little bit. And say Create. Now let's just watch what happens. Might go crazy. It's a little, a little much. Now, one thing I always find with the jiggle deformer is that if we here look here in the attribute editor, the jiggle weight by default is one. For some reason, that seems not to work very well. So I can just change this to 0.9. Uh, and play it again. It 
So that's a little bit better. I get a nice slow sort of wind down. And you can play with stiffness and damping, but this can cause it to go really haywire. So just play with it. Save your scene before you do this, of course. So this animation is a little slow and lethargic. I may speed it up a little bit. That looks good. I might turn the damping down a little bit. I think damping has to do with how quickly it falls off. That's good. So there you go. I'll turn my dynamics back on. Particles are born. These two things split apart. Get a nice little secondary motion there. And uh, Bob's your uncle. Okay, good luck.